welcome everyone and then Mark will take us further. All right, thank you, Kelly and Pastor Jayu. Welcome. Good to see you. And we're going to pray for you at the end. Uh, make sure we pray for Pastor Jayu until he, uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, settled on a, 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 a stable, stable ministry in Korea. All right. So we're going to pray for you and pray for uh, your, your family. Um, all right. So uh, why don't we take some time and say hi to your neighbor? You know, just wave your hands, you know, front and back, you know. Uh, we have been uh, talking about the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible about end times, about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And um, before we go back to uh, the book of Revelation, I think it would be a great idea to digress a little bit, you know, to study something outside of the book of Revelation, uh, to get some idea, some basic concept about what the end time is, is going to be like. So uh, today we're going to uh, not going to go to the book of Revelation today, but we're going to um, read and study Matthew 24. Uh, it is a famous passage, a fam famous uh, well-known sermon given by Jesus called Oliver Discourse, Oliver Sermon. Uh, he gave this uh, sermon on the top of Mount Olives uh, facing Jerusalem. So we're going to study a little bit, but uh, as I said before, uh, as I told you before, remember when you read the Bible, whatever passage you're reading, <clears throat> you need to understand the context, right? What goes before and go what goes after. Matthew 24. Um, if you go back a, a, a few chapters before Matthew 24 to Matthew 21, it is the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ. He rides the donkey and enter uh, the capital city of the Jewish nation. Uh, that was uh, the Palm Sunday, so-called, um, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Um, you know Palm Sunday is coming up, right? Next month, right? The Sunday before Easter Sunday is Palm Sunday. And then after Jesus enters Jerusalem, he cleansed the temple, right? It was a pretty, you know, angry Jesus, right? Not, not the typical gentle, soft-spoken Jesus that... The culture has, has us to believe. Uh, but he cleansed uh, the Jewish temple, and uh, because of the corruption there, uh, he turned the table and all that. And then he entered, Jesus entered into a series of controversies, a series of arguments, very heated debate with the religious authorities in Jerusalem, with the Pharisees and with the scribes and, you know, set uh, and all those people. Um, so it's a very heated debate if you read Matthew 22 and 23. And then come to our passage today, Matthew 24, all of the discourse. So I want to remind you uh, by going back a, a few chapters before 24, this is the last week of Jesus' life on earth. The last week. Remember Palm Sunday and then cleansing the temple couple of days debating and uh, having controversies with the religious authorities in Jerusalem, and then come to Matthew 24, uh, the Olivet Discourse, and Jesus is talking about his second coming. Uh, this is the last week of Jesus' life on earth. So let's look at uh, this uh, sort of a last hour sermon uh, given by Jesus to his disciples. Uh, that is the context here. Um, that is wh whatever uh, being recorded in these chapters and following happened in the very last week, the last few days of Jesus' uh, life on earth. And then he was crucified on the cross, died for our sins. And then on the third day, the next Sunday, he rose from the dead. All right? 24.1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to his buildings. Now, this picture was, is taken on top of Mount of Olives. We are looking westward, as you can see, the old city of Jerusalem, and then beyond that, the high-rise and the modern building, uh, the modern Jerusalem, uh, West Jerusalem, so-called. Um, so, uh, this verse says, uh, when they left the temple, um, the disciples were astonished 
by the beautiful building, the magnificent building uh, of uh, the Jerusalem temple in Jesus' time. Of course, you, you cannot see it right now. But uh, in this picture, you can see there's a rectangular platform, stone-built platform. It's still standing there. And this is what we call the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount equals to 25 American football fields, man-made, 2,000 years ago. So the foundation stone is still standing there. 19 soccer fields. Can you see the corner on the left? All the way extend uh, beyond this picture. 25 football fields. I mean, it was a magnificent building. If you visit Israel with me, I'll bring you to the Western Wall Plaza, <laughs> all right, as your best tour guide. I'll bring you to uh, the so-called waiting wall. Uh, now we usually call uh, Western Wall Plaza. As you enter the plaza, it's an open-air uh, synagogue. The f from, from the floor of the plaza, you count seven rows of stones. Seven rows of stone belong to first century in times of Jesus. And above that, the blue arrow, uh, later, Middle Ages and beyond. So there are at least seven levels of stones, or Herodian stones. Uh, it's kind of like a picture frame being um, dug out from, uh, from natural stone. Uh, very beautiful. First century, still standing there after 2,000 years. In fact, there is a Western Wall tunnel beneath the Western Wall Plaza. You go down about 100 feet below the plaza, you can walk alongside the uh, first century uh, Western Wall, about 500 meter long, 1,600 feet, five city blocks. The biggest stone we find is 40 feet long and 13 feet wide and weigh about 550 metric tons. That one stone in the yellow box there, uh, I hope you can see it, there's the edge, and all the way to the lady uh, taking picture there, one stone, one stone. 500 to 600 metric tons, that is one stone. A male African elephant weighs about seven metric tons. So that one stone, equals 78 elephants. How did the ancient people do that? How, did, how would they move the stone right there, right? It's a remarkable engineering work. That's why the disciples, they came from, if you remember, from the village of uh, Upper Galilee, from simple villages. They came to the urban Jerusalem, and they saw the Herodian temple, and they were astonished. Of course, Jesus had different reaction. Jesus said, do you see all these things? The temple buildings and the retaining walls and all the building and all the structure. I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Again, this picture is taken from the top of Mount Olives toward west, toward the old city of Jerusalem, the huge rectangular platform you can still see today, the Temple Mount, uh, is an extraordinary claim that Jesus made. Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and his temple in AD 70. About 40 years later, it did happen because the Roman armies came to uh, the capital city and they stormed in the city and burned the city and uh, tear down almost every single one of the stones. Now, Matthew 24 is, uh, with this background, is one of the passages that actually support uh, the historical reliability of the words of Jesus. He spoke those words, Matthew 24, 40 years before AD 70, 40 years before uh, the historic uh, destruction of Jerusalem. So, Matthew recorded the words of Jesus spoken uh, before 8070. It was a prophecy fulfilled. Now, some people would say uh, this is not true because it can be prophecy written after the event, right? After the fact, right? 
after 870 and the disciples, because they want to exalt Jesus or they want to protect or defend Jesus, so they made up a story, right? Um, but, you know, this is not likely. Let me tell you why. This is historically not likely. Why? Because if Matthew 24 is prophecy written after the fact, then Matthew 24, as we read the passages, uh, should be more precise. If it is a prophecy written after the fact, after AD 70, it should be more precise because, as you can see, many of the stones were still left standing on others, right? If it's prophecy written after the fact, then this, if, the disciples, if the disciples are trying to make up a story, then they probably won't put some of the words in the mouth of Jesus, right? If it's a prophecy after the event, trying to prove Jesus, they would, they, they would have mentioned that the, the temple of Jerusalem was burned by fire, destroyed by fire. But none of those were in Matthew 24. So, as it stands, Matthew 24 is very likely historical. Words of Jesus spoken 40 years before AD 70, before the destruction of the temple. That is to say, Jesus did predict the destruction of the temple, and it did happen. Matthew, parallel passages of Matthew 24, Mark and Luke, faithfully reports the words of Jesus, and it came fulfilled. Now we're back to uh, 24. We read verse 3. As we go on, uh, what is recorded here is that as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, they exited uh, uh, Jerusalem and they climbed. It's about 15 minutes walk uh, from the Golden Dome. Uh, that marks the Holy of Holies of First and Second Temple right there. Uh, you go down the valley of Kidron and then you come back to where we took the picture top of Mount of Olives. Sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, when would this happen? That is the destruction of the temple. What would be the sign of your coming? What would be the sign of the end of the age? So the disciples are very curious. They came forward to Jesus and say, they asked two questions. When will the destruction of the temple happen. What would be the signs? And what will be the signs of the end time? What will happen before you come back? Now, Matthew 24, 25 and following is Jesus' answer to those two questions. Signs of times. What will you see before AD 70? Before the end of time? Now, as we talk about the last days, according to Jesus, uh, we enter into a subject called eschatology. Now, eschatology sounds like a big word, right? But it's actually very simple in terms of what it says. Uh, it came from a Greek word, eschaton, meaning ending, end time, the destination, the end. So eschatology is the study of what the Bible says about end times, about the last days. Now, in New Testament terms, the last days is the final chapter of human history. Our history, our timeline is the final period. That final period in New Testament terms is between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. And the Bible has a lot to say about the second coming, besides the book of Revelation. It's right here, 24. Uh, verse 4 and following in Matthew. Jesus answered, Watch out, no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will, receive, uh, will deceive many. You will hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end, the telos, or the eschaton, is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, there will be earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. So Jesus goes on to talk about the signs of end times, signs of 
uh, uh, time before uh, the, the temple was destroyed, before the end of age. Uh, we're not going to read it word by word, but uh, let, let me make a list here. These are the things that Jesus talked about. The signs of times, before the destruction of the uh, uh, Jerusalem temple, before the end of our history, false prophets, false messiahs, people would go, go on and say, I'm the Christ, I am the prophet, but they are false prophets. These guys will come out and say, and, and say words that would deceive many, many people. Number two, wars and rumors of wars, civil wars, military invasions. Three, earthquakes, disasters. With, with, with uh, natural disaster earthquakes comes famines. Number five, persecutions of the church. Being a believer will be, will be in a tougher and tougher time. Number six, the gospel will go to the end of the earth. Now, intuitively, intuitively, when we read those words, when we read the signs of times, we naturally think that these things are happening in our time, right? Is that true? Famines, earthquakes, wars, and rumors of wars. Kind of like a checklist, right? Okay, earthquake, check. Famines, check. Wars, check, 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 right? We have a signs of times checklist. So Jesus is coming anytime. False prophets, right? Check, right? Can you check that? A couple of days ago, I received an email from uh, one of my online students. Um, so she sent this email to me and said uh, one of her friends uh, sent her some YouTube video. It's actually in, one in English, one in Mandarin. So the, the YouTube videos are, are, are saying that Russia invading Ukraine right now is that a fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Is that true or not? And those videos claim that to be. What is going on right now in Ukraine is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Now, those videos are referring to a passage in Ezekiel 38 to 39. 38 to 39. It's talking about the end time again uh, in different contexts and talking about Israel's final enemy. And that final enemy, uh, one of them, uh, or the head of them, is called the Prince of Rosh Meshach. Rosh Meshach, okay? So some of those prophecy teachers uh, out there uh, has, have a lot of likes uh, on YouTube and social media. Uh, they will interpret this phrase. The final enemy of Israel is called Prince of Rosh Meshach. Does that sound familiar? They will interpret Rosh as Rus, changing the vowels, Russia, Meshach, he changed the vowels, M Moscow. Okay? All right. You got Russia and Moscow. What is so interesting about this passage is that it's talking about the final enemy of, the end time enemy of Israel. They come from the far north of Israel. Now, if you know the map a little bit more, uh, you understand if you draw a straight line from Israel, according to the, uh, you know, the YouTube uh, 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 prophecy teachers, you draw a straight line from Jerusalem northward, you will hit Moscow. It depends on how you spin the, uh, the, the sphere, right? How you spin the earth. <laughs> but if you know the background a little bit, Meshach is a place name. Refer to Asia Minor. Today's Turkey. Rosh is not a place name, never a place name. In the Bible, outside of the Bible, Assyrian records, you know, Near Eastern records, all that. Rosh. Never a place name. In fact, the term, the modern term, Russia, 
did not appear until 11th century AD after Christ, more than a thousand years after the first century. So this passage, no matter how you interpret it, has nothing to do with Russia, all right? So one more on our checklist, false teachers, false prophecies, false, uh, false messiahs, false prophets. Exactly what Jesus said, right? That's why Jesus start his Olivet Discourse, his sermon, asking his disciples to watch out. No one deceives you because there are many false prophets out there nowadays and back in the days of Jesus as well. Now, if you want to read the Bible, I want you to read the Bible well, okay? I want you to read the Bible well. Back to this list, all right? So forget about Russia, okay? Forget about Russia. It's a, it's a tragedy, all right? We should pray for it. Uh, we, we, should, um, we should support it, uh, support the Ukrainians. Uh, you know, you can send money to uh, Willy Funds and all that. Uh, nothing to do with biblical prophecies, okay? However, if you want to read the Bible well, uh, we must begin with the first audience in mind. So as we read this list of signs, remember this list of signs are words spoken to the first disciples, not to us, right? The first audience is not us. Okay, so we need to read the, the word of Jesus according to their context, not our own context. So don't do the newspaper theology, all right? Okay, you know what newspaper theology is? Okay, we look at the headline news, and then we try to match what the Bible says. Go to the book of Revelation, go to Matthew 24, and try to, try to match, okay, what, what event looks like this, and what event look, looks like that, right? No. If you know a little bit more about the first century context, you would know how to understand what, how the disciples understood the words of Jesus. Now back to this list of signs. Jesus is talking about the time before AD 70. I was in seminary for, uh, for some years. Um, I always wonder, um, you know, one seminary class like New Testament studies, uh, you are required to read about 3,000 to 4,000 pages of reading, academic reading. You read tons of things, right? You read tons of things, just for one class. When I was in seminary about 15, 20 years ago, I always wondered why we didn't spend much time on uh, the uh, literature outside of the New Testament. Right? New Testament, of course, is a lot to read, right? 20, 27 books. But there are tons of things outside of the New Testament, extra biblical writings, that should inform us about the immediate context, the first century context of New Testament. If you read the Jewish Wars, chapter 5 and 6, by Josephus, a Jewish historian in Jesus' time, he was not a Christian, uh, very trustworthy in general, a historian. He wrote tons of things. And Josephus talks so much about the time before AD 70, before the destruction of the Jerusalem temple by the Romans. He mentioned false prophets. Many people claim to be the prophets. Josephus talks about wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, happening in Italy, in the land of Palestine, in Turkey, in today's Turkey, famines. So if you go with this list, you go to Josephus, Jewish War, chapter 5 and 6, you actually can check off quite a bit from this list. Jesus was referring to his generation, AD 30 to AD 70, 40 years. What happened in their world? It was such a chaos, right? Of course, persecution of the church, Josephus did not mention much, but you can tell from just New Testament writings alone. Persecution of the church. So many of these things men mentioned by Jesus happened in the first century. Josephus was one of the eyewitnesses. The first generations of uh, 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 Jewish Christians, they saw all of this. 
But how about gospel to the end of the earth? You ask the question, no way that happened in the first generation, right? We have internet, we have IG, we have social media. Now we can do that, right? Back then, no way. Well, you check some other New Testament passages like Colossians 1, 5 to 6. Paul wrote the gospel that has come to you, Colossians, all over the world. This gospel is bearing fruit and growing. 123 and other passages in Romans also talk about this gospel has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. So in some sense, in real sense, the gospel has already reached over, all over the known world of the, of the apostles. In some sense, in some real sense, because all of the world can mean all sorts of people. When the Jewish Christians broke out of Jerusalem and spread the gospel everywhere they went, they bring the gospel with them. So all sorts of people are hearing the gospel. The Greco-Roman world, the non-Jewish world, they heard the gospel. So they have seen all the signs and they have the reasons to expect the second coming of Jesus happening anytime, especially when they saw the destruction of Jerusalem Temple in 1870. Now, of course, there were many things in uh, Matthew 24. Uh, are some of them are fulfilled in the first generation, and some of them are pointing beyond 1870 to the end of the age. Uh, we can go through more details next time. But in any case, I want to wrap up today's message by uh, this timeline, this chart. If you want to understand what Jesus, what the New Testament talks about end times, this is the chart. The bottom line is our age. It will come to the end. And Jesus has come. The first coming of Jesus happened already. But when Jesus came, he came with power. He brings in the future age, the new heaven, new earth. In some sense, in a very real sense, because of the first coming of Jesus, the next age, what we call heaven, but actually it's heaven and earth, new heaven and earth, has already been inbreaking into our age. That is the uh, top arrow right there. So right now we are living in kind of in between between first coming and second coming of Christ. The future age, in some sense, fundamentally, spiritually, in the very real sense, has already in breaking into our age. So we are in this in-between time, we can call it already, but not yet. Already, meaning that the future age is no longer just in the future. It is now, the kingdom of God is now in our hearts, in our midst. The spirit of, uh, is working in our hearts, in our lives. The future age has come here, already been inaugurated, or already been uh, inbreaking into our, our present age. Now, most of the signs have happened in the first coming of Jesus, as I told you. AD 70. But the end of our age with the second coming of Christ is not yet. Therefore, when you think of our time, we're living in this time in between. It's a already, but not yet. However, we are definitely getting closer and closer to the eschaton, to the second coming of Christ. That's why Jesus said, you do not know when exactly I will come, but I will come any time, right? I will come any time. Now, this realization should affect how we live today. Already, meaning the future kingdom has made an inbreaking into your world, into your life. And you are no longer what you used to be. Because the life of the kingdom of God has already been a reality in your life. 
However, not yet on this side of heaven. We're not in heaven yet. We're not in new heaven and new earth yet. But it will happen any time. Now, we modern people are very impatient, right? Where are we? If you say, uh, in Matthew 24, go over the checklist, the first generation of disciples, they understood all of these signs have been fulfilled in their generation, AD 30 and to AD 70. That means, in hindsight, from our perspective now, the first generation of disciples, they were living in the beginning of the end time. How about us? We are living at the end of the end time. They were expecting the second coming of Jesus. We are also expecting the coming of Jesus. Yeah, we say, why the delay, right? 2,000 years, come on, man. If you come, please come, right? When are you coming? Well, let me remind you with one verse from 2 Peter 3, 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. One day is like a thousand days, a thousand years, in God's sight. So if you remember this chart, so far in God's timing, it's only two days, right? Remember what you did two days ago? Remember what you did yesterday? You may have forgotten, right? Gone like that. In God's timing, two days only. However, Jesus keeps reminding us to wait patiently and to wait and be alert and be prepared, right? Be prepared for the coming of our Lord because we need to give an account of our lives. How do we use our time, our treasure, our talents, right? The three T's. How do we use our time and treasure and, 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 and our, our, our resources? Do we use it to ex extend and advance the gospel? To extend the kingdom? Or do we just bury it on the ground, right? We need to give an account. And we need to wait and prepare. Prepare for the coming of our Lord anytime. Anytime soon. When I was a really young kid, all right, I was in Hong Kong back then. Sometimes my mom in the afternoon, uh, she would say to me, with some tone of warning, she would say to me, "Wait till your back, your dad comes back." It's a very meaningful sentence. Now you could have two different reactions, right? As a small kid, right? Wait till your dad comes back. The first reaction, of course, is you're afraid, right? You have done something wrong. Um, and you should repent. And then you can wait in fear. <laughs> That's your first reaction. The second reaction, as a small kid, wait till your dad comes back. That you're excited for the coming of your dad because you have done well. Well, as, as Asian, you have done well in school, right? And then you actually anticipate the coming of your father, right? Either or. Either you're afraid or you're anticipating the coming of the Lord. There's no time to waste, guys. We are living at the end of the end times, right? Now, I'm not suggesting, okay, please understand, I'm not suggesting, okay, let's quit our day job and then we get gathered together, we worship, you know, here, Okay, uh, sell off of your uh, properties. You bought a new house, sell it. All right. If you have any stock in the sell it. Okay, we're gonna gather here and then we'll wait for uh, the, the alien to come and something like that. I'm not suggesting that. And in fact, the first century Christians, 
They were eagerly expecting the second coming of Jesus Christ. They never done something like that, right? Only the occult or the cults would do that, right? What did they do? First generation of Christians. They expect, they saw the signs. What did they do? They set the orientation of their life toward the future kingdom. No matter what they do, whether they are farmers, they are slaves, they are masters, they are businessmen, they orient their direction toward the kingdom, toward the, uh, the second coming of Christ. We are living at the end of the age. Set your orientation, set your direction toward the coming kingdom, toward the coming Christ. If you are going to school, pray and be alert. Do, do your, do, uh, go through your school with the long direction, with the general direction to glorify God, right? If you're working adults, do so to honor God with your three T's, your time, your talent, and your treasure, to, ex to advance the kingdom of God, all right? So if you understand eschatology in the Bible, it doesn't do any sort of, you know, escape reality. It's not escape game, all right? It's not like we gather together and then we we'll wait for Jesus to come, come and then, okay, we'll be raptured out of this world, right? It's not escape. It's to engage. The New Testament eschatology tells you and me that we are future people. We are in some sense from the future because, the, the, because our home is in the future. Whatever characterizes our future home, love, peace, righteousness, justice, we bring it over here. We make it the reality. Now, this is the transforming, life transforming idea. If we understand we are living at the end of the end time and Jesus is coming back anytime soon, we are called to change our orientation of our lives toward the new creation. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. I hope you and I are ready. Ready for the second coming of Christ. Ready to give an account to our master, to our Lord, right? Um, you know, give what you have, right? Give what you have toward the kingdom. Be a good steward. Biblical stewardship. How you manage your time. Are you wasting your time? How you manage your resource. Are you wasting your resource for something unrelated to the gospel, unrelated to the kingdom? We repent and we change. And we yearn for the coming back of Jesus Christ. Let's all pray together. Dear God, we give you thanks for you are the master of history. You created us all. You are the creator. And you are also the redeemer. You are the Lord of our history. Help us understand we are living in the end of the end times, and we are expecting your coming. And we pray that we will anticipate your coming, not in fear, but in faith. Help us to use our resources to extend your kingdom, to worship you, to serve you. Use our time, our talents, our treasure to honor your name to extend your gospel, to let your gospel reach to the end of the earth. There are so many people who haven't heard of the name of Jesus. There are so many people who have not received the gospel. And we're going to send our missionaries, we're going to support uh, uh, the movement of the gospel. We're going to build up your church so that your name will be glorified. And we pray that you will help us to be faithful stewards of the things that you have given to us. No matter we are in school, in our work, in our family, in our marriage, we want to do it to honor your name, to make your name famous. In Christ's name, pray. Amen, right?